Good afternoon, my name is uh, Itzik Manting. I'm uh, going to talk to today about uh, phishing and uh, account takeover uh, attacks. Um, third, uh, first, I want to th uh, thank you for staying that late. This is the, the closing session of the, uh, uh, of the conference, so I appreciate that. A couple of words about uh, myself. So, uh, I am a director of uh, security research at uh, Imperva. I'm leading a, a group of uh, researchers in uh, data security. I have uh, 18 years of uh, experience in various uh, security industries where I did uh, security design, security analysis, and in general, uh, innovation and problem solving in all kinds of uh, security related problems. I have a master degree in the math and the computer science. I did that uh, with the professor Adi Shamir, who is the S of RSA. Uh, together we researched uh, the security of the uh, Cypher RC4, which was developed by uh, Ron Rivest for MIT, which is the R of RSA. So I came from the world of uh, cryptography. Uh, I'm also an uh, ultra marathoner. Uh, this picture I, uh, I run with uh, uh, 61 uh, kilometer trail running. Uh, part of it, my son uh, joined me. I took this picture. And uh, this is my uh, LinkedIn profile. In the research that I'm going to present, uh, we took a fish the fishers uh, approach. Uh, we wanted to understand better how account takeover attacks uh, are uh, working and how they are uh, done. So uh, we did to the phishing uh, attackers what they do to their victims. Uh, we lured them into our environment and we uh, traced their activity there. And uh, this, this is the research that, we've, that we did and uh, we'll uh, share with you the uh, result of this research. So, uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this research is detailed uh, in a report that we released. Uh, it is called the Beyond Takeover, Stories from a Hacked Account. Uh, if this, uh, this session is interesting for you, I really encourage you to, uh, to go and look for this uh, research or, uh, or approach me and I will provide a, a link to it uh, with all the details of this research. Uh, led this research was uh, Luda Lazar, a uh, cyber threat uh, researcher from uh, my group. Uh, in addition, uh, we joined the effort with uh, students from the Israel uh, Technion, uh, Israel Institute of uh, Technology, uh, students uh, Tamar Gatas and uh, Joanna Yakub, which also participated in this uh, research. In addition, uh, we used uh, very uh, intensively a framework that is called uh, Canary Tokens that was provided by uh, things that applied the research. I'll talk about that uh, later. I uh, will start with uh, phishing and uh, account takeover. So uh, from the recent uh, uh, Verizon report on the data breaches, it turns out that 43% of the, of the breaches involve the social attacks and social attacks are usually associated with, uh, with phishing. And as you can see uh, in the red arrow, this, uh, uh, the trend is that it goes uh, up, meaning that uh, uh, phishing is, is, is a, a real, a social, and social attacks are a real threat and, uh, and growing. Uh, some additional statistics from this report. So 80% of uh, the financially motivated breaches involved uh, phishing. And uh, this uh, diagram that you see is the click rate. What is the chances of uh, employees for organization of, of, of different uh, verticals, of different uh, domains, uh, to click on, uh, on a phishing uh, link. Uh, and when once they, they click, that there is a high chance that they will uh, uh, follow the link and uh, uh, be uh, um, uh, uh, fall into the, uh, the phishing uh, trap. So, what comes after phishing? After phishing, the attacker gets credentials and then he does what you call an account takeover. He can do this for several reasons. One of them is, uh, is fraud. You want to do identity theft. This is one, uh, one threat. Another attack is to uh, hijack your uh, bank account and uh, to do fraudulent uh, transactions. Uh, other uh, motivations for the attackers is to steal secret data, either from your, uh, from your mail account or uh, maybe to use this, uh, the phishing and credential uh, theft in order to, uh, to put a foothold within your organization and start um, moving on then uh, there to the uh, business uh, data of your organization. 
Um, so espionage is one objective, uh, stealing contacts, using them uh, for uh, further attacks. There is also, and we saw all, uh, several uh, indications for that, uh, account abuse, using your account as part of, uh, of the attacker infrastructure, and then you will be used for, uh, for spamming, for phishing, um, for distribution of, uh, of, uh, of uh, malware, and sometimes even using social networks to promote um, a site or person or idea. So how does the phishing work? So usually it starts with a phishing mail. The phishing mail will be sent to a, a large and uh, to a large number of, uh, of recipients. Uh, if you press this link, you will get into a fake website. This fake website will probably resemble, or look exactly like a website that you are familiar with, either your uh, bank account or your mail account or uh, anything like that. And, uh, if you, uh, and in this website, you will be asked to put your credentials or any other sensitive information that the, the attacker wants. It can be, for example, your uh, mother maiden name, if this is the uh, the detail that is missing for him to uh, get into your bank account. But usually it will be uh, uh, the username and password for your account. Uh, this link can be also lead you to a malware download. And from that point on, uh, the attacker will uh, uh, have uh, his uh, foothold in your, uh, uh, in your uh, uh, desktop and uh, control your, uh, uh, everything that you are doing. And of course, there are uh, vari uh, variations of this, um, of this flow. So how does the phishing, uh, um, uh, phishing ecosystem look like? So while in the past, in the early days of uh, phishing, I'm sorry. Okay. in the early days of uh, uh, phishing, the attackers needed to do everything by themselves. They had to generate the clone site, they had to build the infrastructure to, uh, to uh, harvest and to collect the credentials, and they had to maintain them. Uh, today, this is not the case. Today, there are uh, do-it-yourself kits. You just uh, download the kit, and then you can, uh, with a couple of links, you are getting uh, a clone of your favorite uh, target site. And there are even uh, more than that. There is um, what we call a phishing as a service. You can uh, pay for a very reasonable uh, amount, like a couple of dollars per, uh, per month, and you have a phishing campaign ongoing, and you, all, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to, to clone the site. You don't have to build infrastructure. Everything is collected and you only get uh, all the credentials that they were uh, harvested uh, to your uh, mail. But uh, regardless of uh, what is the, how the phishing works, then eventually the, uh, the account takeover can, is, uh, uh, has the same uh, objectives and same uh, motivations. In uh, our research, uh, we wanted to understand better the dynamics of uh, account takeover attack. Uh, in particular, it's a relation with, uh, with data breaches when they come into the organizations. We also wanted to, un to understand better what attackers, to try to put ourselves in the, in the shoe of the attacker and understand uh, how they work, what, what, uh, what is more attractive for them, what are their methods, and what are their practices. And uh, this is the thing that I will uh, share with you. So the first uh, part of the, uh, of the research was set up and uh, maintenance. What we did, we, uh, we generated 90 uh, dummy accounts in uh, different uh, uh, services that are known to be uh, very popular uh, phishing uh, targets. Uh, and we put an, an infrastructure framework for monitoring the activity within the accounts. I will uh, talk in uh, details about uh, how we did that. Uh, then, instead of waiting for the attackers to come in, we uh, invited them in. Uh, we. Uh, uh, leaked the credentials, the usernames and password of these accounts into uh, uh, live uh, phishing, com phishing campaigns. And eventually we uh, took the data that uh, came out from this uh, research. This, was, this, is a, this is a long-term research. It took us uh, nine months to, uh, from the, the moment that we started until we, uh, we finished that. And we analyzed this data to uh, try to see the, uh, the trends in, uh, in the behavior of, uh, of attackers. I'll start with uh, explaining in detail about uh, the research, that, uh, the research uh, process. So uh, our bait network included uh, 60 email accounts that were, as I said, in uh, popular uh, mail services that are popular with uh, phishing uh, attackers. So uh, we used, of course, a Gmail and Outlook, Yandex, and, uh, um, and uh, except for that, we generated several uh, dummy identities which each one of them had several accounts. 
both an email account but also uh, account in social network uh, networks and in the file hosting uh, services. The idea of that is we wanted to see also the propagation between one account and the other, uh, in particular uh, around uh, uh, the notion of uh, password reuse. Everybody knows that users reuse passwords. It is uh, very hard to, uh, to remember to generate a, a large number of passwords. And we were interested to see if we see attackers taking a password from one account and trying to use it to, uh, to propagate to uh, another account of the uh, uh, same person. And for that, we used uh, uh, these uh, group, uh, groups of uh, accounts. In order to make the, uh, the account look uh, authentic, we, of course, didn't leave them uh, empty. We uh, filled them with, uh, with a lot of uh, mails in the inbox, in the sent items. We generated folders that uh, look uh, suspicious or more accurately to look, look more attractive, like uh, passwords and credit cards and things that resemble things that we believe that attackers are, uh, are after. Uh, we generated, uh, we uh, put our, uh, email, um, our, uh, uh, our email addresses in various uh, news group and websites and of course the, the, the spam, did it. it didn't take my, uh, long until uh, we, uh, we were bombed with a lot of uh, spam like uh, every normal uh, email account. Uh, for the social ne networks, we uh, generated connections between, uh, between our uh, accounts and themselves. And of course, may we got a lot of uh, friend requests from others. And uh, I think some of the profiles that we generated have more, uh, have more, fa more Facebook friends than, than I do. Uh, also in the file hosting services, we uh, put a lot of uh, files, and again, as we did in the mail accounts, we, uh, we put their uh, files that look very, uh, uh, very appealing, very interesting, with, uh, uh, with uh, special names and, uh, and, uh, and uh, interesting uh, content. Uh, for the account monitoring, we uh, wanted to uh, monitor two things. The first one is the penetration into an account. We wanted to see attackers uh, logging in. And the second, we wanted to track the, uh, the, data, the data access uh, patterns within the account. So for the first uh, part, we uh, mostly used a service that is provided by most of the mail services today, which is where at the, the moment they are seeing a login that comes uh, from something new, new device, new browser, new application, new uh, geo. Uh, they will uh, send you an email asking you whether this is um, uh, a correct one. Of course, we answered yes, it is us, uh, even though it, is, it, it was not us. Uh, but this gave us an indication of, uh, of uh, new uh, of, uh, logins uh, by the attackers. Uh, other places, there are uh, archives that you can download from some of the services. And there is a recent activity page that you can, uh, you can look at all, having this, uh, all of this having this information of uh, uh, when and how uh, login uh, occurred. Uh, for the activity within the account, we use the uh, Canary Tokens uh, uh, framework. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this framework. I, I, I will present it in a couple of minutes. But it is a, a, a very nice uh, framework that uh, allows you to, uh, to build documents and links. And whenever someone opens this document or uh, presses on this link, then you will get notification to the mail account that you uh, uh, the, that you uh, specified in advance. So this uh, uh, system is called the uh, Canary Tokens. Uh, as I said, it is by uh, Things to apply the research, and uh, it's it just a framework for generating uh, decoys. Uh, the type of this decoy, the type that we used in uh, our research, uh, the first one was uh, uh, URLs, uh, called the uh, web bugs in their uh, terminology. And when we get an alert every time someone enters this, try to access this, send an HTTP request to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, URL. The second is Microsoft Word document. Uh, you know that n no attacker will be, uh, uh, will, ig will ignore a Microsoft Word document that look interesting for him. And uh, the third one was uh, uh, zip folders, archives, uh, that whenever someone opens this zip in the file explorer, Explorer and uh, starts to, uh, to browse between the folders, then we are getting uh, uh, the alert. So these are the three types of, uh, of decoys that uh, uh, we used. We'll show a short. Um, this is uh, uh, how it looks. 
So the, uh, you choose the type, which is WebBug URL, you put uh, your email address, and you put also um, a label that will assist you later to associate the alert that you're seeing. And now you have this link, and this is the link that we, you can, is ready to use. You can now put it in every place you want, like for example, in our case, in the, in the mail. Uh, if you press this link, if someone presses this link, you will get this uh, uh, forbidden uh, access, which is quite natural. This is something that will not raise it uh, suspicious. And a couple of seconds later, a couple of seconds later, okay, okay, you will get uh, an email, and in this uh, uh, email, this is the alert. You can see uh, the timestamp, when it happened, what happened, which uh, you see, of course, uh, the label of the. Uh, of the uh, of the link that was uh, generated, and of course you get information about the place where uh, the the user agent and the IP uh, from which uh, this uh, uh, this link was uh, was pressed, and this is the information that we uh, used in this research. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's it for the, uh, building the, uh, the, the, uh, the the setup, building the uh, the account, and building the monitoring framework. And the, the, yes, the network of uh, sensors. Next, we needed to, uh, we are ready to, uh, uh, to see the attackers, uh, to, to have them in. Uh, for that, we used uh, two open source, uh, uh, two uh, uh, public uh, uh, feeds of, um, of uh, phishing campaigns. Usually, the way these are used is as blacklist that uh, clients or, uh, or uh, application security providers can use in order to, uh, uh, to prevent users from uh, getting into these sites, but of course, in this case, we did exactly the other way around. We took uh, active campaigns. We took the the, the most fresh ones, ones only that uh, every, every day we took those that were uh, released, uh, added to the blacklist uh, today, and we uh, went to these pages and we uh, entered uh, our uh, uh, our the credentials of our accounts, and then we uh, actually invited the attackers in and we waited to see. Uh, when and how they will uh, will come in. Uh, one of the m most significant challenge in this in, in this process was the maintenance of, uh, of this this large number of accounts. It was very hard to, to maintain them. It took a lot of uh, uh, a lot of effort. Uh, due to this reason, we wanted to reuse accounts. So the way we worked. We did uh, a round of uh, uh, leaking the credentials to different uh, uh, phishing pages. And then uh, we waited to see if attackers come in. Sometimes they came in, sometimes not. So after a period of usually about two weeks or, yeah, or more than that, we just uh, reset the entire process. Uh, we changed the password, we uh, refreshed the content, and we started a new uh, leakage uh, around. This time we could use every account uh, more, than, uh, more than once. Uh, next, uh, we'll talk about, uh, I will uh, present the, the results of uh, what we saw uh, after the attackers got into the account. So, the first uh, statistics, the first uh, number. Uh, out of uh, 200 leakages that we have did, uh, only 44%, which is 88 uh, cases, we actually saw attackers getting in. Now, it is possible that some of the phishing pages that we visited and we leaked to uh, were, were already down. But we still believe that this, uh, this number is not, is not far from reality, which means that one out of two uh, leakages eventually leads to, uh, uh, to account uh, takeover. Uh, from uh, these uh, uh, 44 uh, percent, we saw that uh, we wanted to see how many of them are accessed once and how many of them are accessed more than once. And we saw that two thirds of them were accessed only once and one third were accessed uh, more than once, uh, which is uh, the, about uh, 30 accounts and uh, 99 uh, access uh, events. And when we looked at the uh, access to data, th th we had two kinds of sensors. There was the, the login sensors and the uh, data access sensors. As for the data access sensors, we saw uh, interestingly that in 77% uh, of, uh, of the accounts, we didn't see any, even a single uh, data access. Uh, and only in 23% uh, uh, we saw actually data access within the account, which means that in, ma in many of the cases, and now the, the blue, uh, and the blue uh, part 
in the uh, in the top uh, circle is a, has a very strong correlation with the blue part in the uh, in, in the bottom one, because whenever there was uh, there was single access, uh, whenever there was we saw data access, then this data access came from uh, accounts that were accessed uh, several times. Um, what we uh, there are several possible explanations for this. Um, one of them is that. Um, uh, attackers, when they got the, uh, the credentials, they went into the account, they did some, just wanted to validate that it is possible to use these credentials, that they are correct, and from that point on, they, they took them and put them in a database of, uh, and uh, for trading uh, as validated stolen credentials, as opposed to invalidated uh, stolen credentials, which probably cost, uh, uh, cost uh, less. Uh, we saw also that 61% uh, of, the, of the canary tokens of the data access that we've seen uh, came, from, uh, came not in the first access to this account, but to, uh, in uh, further accesses. Uh, and again, interesting obse observation that whenever we saw several accesses, we saw them from different IPs. In most of the cases, we didn't see them from, from the same IP uh, being accessed uh, over and over, which can probably uh, um, um, be the, um, uh, stem from uh, using a uh, Tor or other anonymous network. Next, we wanted to see uh, how much time uh, it takes from the moment we leak the credentials until the, uh, the account is actually uh, hacked. So in, in this diagram, the 100% the, the, the of the entire population is all the accounts that were actually uh, hacked. Uh, and you can see that from this, in the first 24 hours, 46% uh, uh, of the accounts were hacked. Uh, and uh, after um, uh, two weeks, uh, the chances of getting hacked, of, uh, of getting hacked, of course, is is uh, is uh, continually decreasing. Um, and what uh, stems from from here is that if you take two these two observations, the first one is that 56 percent of the uh, of the credentials are actually not used; nobody uses them uh, for hacking. And 54% uh, of the exploitations, when they, ha when they do happen, they happen after more than 24 hours. So if you multiply these two factors, then what you're getting is that uh, if you can detect in time the, the fact that you, uh, your credentials, you put your credentials in, in the wrong place, you have about uh, three out of four or four out of five chances that you uh, can change your password within 24 hours and then you can uh, save yourself from, uh, from being, uh, your, your account from being hacked. So this is uh, something that was, uh, at least to, to some extent, surprising for us, uh, an interesting uh, observation. Next, we wanted to look about uh, uh, how, uh, how much time attackers spend within the, uh, within the account. So this is uh, the, the, the distribution. You can see that the, the average is about uh, uh, 10 minutes from the, uh, from the, the login to the, uh, and the last uh, data access alert uh, that we've seen. Uh, most of them, 97% are less than uh, half an hour. There was one that was 52, uh, uh, 52 minutes, uh, but it was uh, really uh, exceptional. Um, uh, next, we uh, wanted to understand uh, whether attackers use the password reuse practices of users. So, uh, as I said, we had uh, a group of accounts in different uh, uh, services. And we uh, leaked the, the, the lead account, the mail account that is, uh, was used to access all the, uh, all the other uh, services. Um, and all the accounts within this group had the same username, which is, was the mail address, and the same uh, password. And then we waited to see if attackers will uh, come. Uh, so we waited and waited. And uh, any, anyone want to guess uh, what is the, uh, the percentage of uh, password reuse that we've seen? How many people think it is uh, less than 50%? Uh, okay, how many think it is more than 50%? Okay, so actually if you, if you would ask me uh, before making this research, I would definitely uh, say it is more than 50%, probably 70 or 80. But the number that we've seen was actually 16% only, uh, which was very surprising for us because it, it, it looks like the, the most obvious thing to do uh, but uh, from our experiment, when, and I know this experiment is, is limited and sometimes it, it, it is biased for different reasons, but, but it, was, it, it was very clear that uh, this is an, a much less uh, than that, so it was 
uh, very surprising. So I'm, I'm not encouraging anyone to, uh, to reuse password. This is, this is a bad practice and, and should be avoided because 16% is still significant enough uh, that, uh, uh, to, uh, to make you not, not use this practice, but uh, still this number is uh, uh, surprisingly low. Okay, so uh, we'll continue uh, and look at uh, what attackers are doing uh, within the account. Here we have another demo. Okay, so uh, what you see here is an attacker uh, looking at and getting into the account. So uh, they look at the inbox, they look at the different uh, folders, especially those that are uh, more uh, appealing with the good names like uh, uh, credit cards and uh, things like that. They look at the sent mail. This is something that we saw uh, quite uh, many attackers. And they uh, propagate from the, uh, since they have your Gmail account, they will go to your Google Drive and uh, have a look about uh, on the, the files that you have there, which also include a lot of uh, data. So when we try to, uh, we took all the data access uh, that, that, that we've seen, and we uh, tried to get some, to figure out some statistics about uh, which type of data is more interesting for attackers than, uh, than uh, others. So we definitely saw that uh, anything that is related to password that can allow the, 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 uh, the attacker to propagate to other uh, accounts uh, was, uh, was first access. This is the, third, the, the first thing, most of, most of the data access that we've seen uh, came uh, on the base of this time. Uh, second was uh, credit cards, which is also uh, very, very valuable. And uh, about 10% each for uh, contact list and for uh, suppliers and customers, which uh, we try to resemble something that looks like uh, something that the attacker can use as, uh, to attack the business in, uh, in, in, in uh, some sense. Uh, some of the passwords were for personal accounts. Some of them we try to make them that to resemble uh, uh, enterprise accounts. Uh, so eventually, if you take this and, and sum this up, then you get about a three to one uh, relation between access to, uh, to personal data and access to, uh, uh, to business data. When it comes to uh, where the attacker looks, so all the attackers look at the inbox, of course, but a uh, significant uh, portion of the attacks look also at the sent items, which actually make, make a lot of sense. It was very surprising. Actually, we, we, we expect that this will happen. This is why we put in the sent items uh, a part of our uh, uh, part of our uh, uh, of our base because you know the inbox of everyone is full with uh, spam. It's very hard to understand from there what really this user is up to. If you, uh, you look at your sent items uh, folder, then uh, it is easier to understand what is interest. What, what is, does this user? What did he do in the last uh, week or the last uh, month? And start exploring his uh, uh, his account. Uh, Twelve percent of the uh, of the attackers uh, moved from the uh, from the Gmail to the. Uh, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, Google Drive uh, folder and look for uh, data uh, there. Uh, regarding the, uh, the effectiveness of the different traps, as I said, there were, we had three types of traps. We have the, uh, the, the URLs, we had the uh, MS Word documents, and we had the uh, folders. And we saw that 68% uh, of the traps that were uh, stepped on were uh, web bags, were URLs. 25% uh, were uh, Word documents, and only 7% were uh, zip archives. Uh, you can start to deduce from here, you, you can think about what can be the reason for that. Uh, so it might be that attackers are more uh, cautious regarding uh, Word documents, but um, at least m my uh, conclusion from, uh, fr fr from this research is that the attackers, they, they really, they want to get into the account and to, as as fast as possible to scan it to look to see if there is anything interesting and uh, and and if not to uh, to proceed to the next account. So uh, just if you see a URL, you press it, then you have in uh, in five seconds you can figure out whether this is something interesting or not. If this is a Word document, it will take some time until it downloads until it opens. If it is a zip archive, then same. Then I think the reason for this uh, uh, for this uh, uh, statistics is is really that they really want to uh, to do the scanning as, as fast as possible. They have a lot of accounts. They want to, to, to scan them uh, fast. They want to get to the next account. And this is the reason for this uh, statistic. But, but um, um, each one of you can, can take this to, uh, 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 to find the other uh, alternative explanation. 
Another thing that we've seen is uh, account abuse. In 12% of, uh, of the cases, we saw actually attackers taking these accounts that we leaked and using it to mount another attacks. So uh, in, the, in 11 cases, it was uh, we uh, joined uh, a spamming uh, botnet. Uh, some of them were uh, spreading a phishing uh, campaign. Others were part of inheritance uh, scams, uh, say, telling you the people that uh, you have you are uh, you inherited some money and you need to use their bank account, and they will give you some uh, portion for uh, for this money for, uh, for that. Yes, yes. There is still this, this thing is still is still going on. It is not uh, it didn't dis didn't uh, disappear. We also uh, saw an anecdotal uh, other things like a malware delivery that we saw uh, once, and uh, we actually we um, when we uh, in we leaked when we saw one account being hacked, and afterwards we seen in the other accounts that were in his contact list, we saw them getting uh, spam from this account. Uh, and we concluded that the attackers, they take the contact list of, of, uh, of, the, of the users, of the accounts, and they use them to, uh, to continue and, and find uh, valid targets for uh, further uh, phishing campaigns. Uh, we had one case that was uh, very interesting. We expected to see more than that, uh, which is, uh, was a full uh, account takeover. So at the beginning, about uh, 5 uh, p.m., the attacker uh, uh, did uh, his uh, login. And about an hour and a half later, he changed the recovery mail. And uh, immediately then, he changed the password. And uh, instead of trying to stay uh, uh, slow and low, he uh, took, uh, uh, took charge of our account. And it took him a uh, further uh, 15 minutes to think that um, we might try to brute force his account. And uh, he added a two-step uh, verification and added his phone number. And we lost uh, control of, uh, of this account. Another question uh, that was very interesting for us to, uh, to try to understand is whether when attackers go and investigate the account, the, the content of the account, are they doing this manually or are they using automated uh, tools? So several indications that we've seen. First, we've seen uh, very, very selective uh, data access. It's not like someone uh, took all the, 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 the data access baits that we put, but only those that looked more uh, interesting. We also seen uh, that the access was discontinued. We didn't see like a batch of, uh, of 50 data access uh, triggers within, uh, within one minute, but we, see, we saw uh, one, and a couple of minutes later, another one. Uh, another, uh, one of the models that we wanted to, to understand whether, users, whether attackers are, are using or, or not is whether they, they, use, they are using automation to download all the content to their the desktop and then to investigate it uh, there. Uh, in this case, we would expect that uh, we'll see uh, that from the, 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 the login, we will see uh, it will take a, a lot of time until we, we start to see the data access patterns, the data access triggers, but we didn't see that. Actually, what we saw is that uh, almost immediately after the, in the first three minutes uh, after the, uh, the login, we saw the first uh, uh, data access and we conclude from that that uh, this uh, possibility of users download, uh, of attackers downloading the entire uh, content of the mailbox to their, uh, uh, to their uh, uh, desktop and investigate it there, this is not what uh, uh, really happening. So our conclusion is that uh, uh, definitely manual uh, labor, this is what they do. We, we didn't see any, uh, uh, any indication of any automated uh, uh, work there. Uh, next, we'll see what the attackers are doing to cover their, uh, their tracks. So the attacker here, uh, you can see that there is a mail coming from Google saying that the new sign-in from a new device. This is something that, that, that many attackers uh, uh, found and uh, erased without uh, a lot of uh, thinking. Uh, some of them, quite few, I think actually it was one, that also deleted it from the trash folder. Uh, so this is, uh, attackers are, are, they try to cover the traces, but, but not uh, to the end of it. Uh, sometimes they mark uh, messages that they read that were marked before that as unread. 
So they mark them again as unread to eliminate uh, the suspicious of the, of the account owner if he gets to the account and he sees that, uh, that uh, something that he didn't read uh, looks uh, like red. And when they use the account for, um, uh, for uh, spamming, they uh, delete, in, in, in some cases we saw them deleting the, from the sent items uh, folder all the uh, mails that uh, they sent from this, uh, um, this account. So there are many things that we saw attackers do. Uh, but uh, we were somehow uh, disappointed to see that they didn't do that very, this uh, very often. So uh, only 17% of the, of the attackers really covered their, uh, their, uh, their tracks. So it was much less than one out of six. It is not that much. 15% uh, uh, deleted the signing alerts uh, from the inbox. 13% uh, uh, deleted the sent mails and failure notice uh, messages when they uh, took, uh, uh, did uh, uh, further uh, spamming from our account. Uh, only 3% marked uh, messages as unread, and uh, only 2%, which is, I think, a single or maybe two uh, attackers, really uh, eliminated all the, uh, the evidence from the account, including from the, uh, from the trash. Uh, what you can co conclude from this, uh, two things, either that the attackers are uh, careless, uh, or they just don't care. They have so many accounts, so they don't care if they, they get caught. They don't care if you if you block them, if you change your password, because they have so many other accounts that they need to uh, to look into that uh, they don't want to spend uh, the time and the effort uh, required to uh, eliminate their uh, traces. Next, we try to uh, to do a small exercise and try to trace uh, where uh, the source uh, the, 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 the source or the attackers uh, where they're coming from. So we did, uh, of course, a geo distribution of the IPs. So uh, from 187 logins that uh, we've seen from 167 IP addresses, which were distributed among uh, uh, 18 countries. But uh, this number of 18, I think, is, it, it might be misleading, and I will tell you uh, why in a second. We were expecting to see vast majority of these uh, accesses coming from uh, um, anonymous somewhat to, that they hide their IPs, either coming from Tor or from anonymous networks, or even from, you know, from, uh, from Amazon or other uh, ho hosting service that, uh, to, that attackers will do this from IPs that they don't care to, be, to get blacklisted, because this is not them. But uh, again, we were very disappointed to see that only 39% of the, of the access were actually from uh, these uh, kind of IPs, uh, which is uh, very low. So m more than half of the accesses were done from IPs that might be be actually belong to the uh, attacker. So the uh, geo distribution was, uh, um, this is the, the, the leading uh, three countries. So you can see that uh, Nigeria and United States are uh, leading with 34% uh, for Nigeria, uh, a well-known, unfortunately, source for, uh, uh, for uh, phishing campaigns, uh, and 42% for the United States. Uh, however, uh, this picture is uh, misleading because this includes all the anonymous uh, frameworks. So if you uh, remove from these all the access from Tor or from uh, other anonymous proxy uh, networks or from, from uh, hosting services, then you get uh, uh, different pictures where the, the, the portion of Nigeria grows to 55% uh, and uh, of the United States it decreases to 22%, uh, uh, which means that the majority of the, of the activity that we've seen uh, came from uh, Nigeria. Uh, for the other countries, like you see here, uh, uh, South Africa, um, I, I'm even not sure, you know, because the list that we're, we're using of, uh, of IP addresses and, you know, store and anonymous proxies, you know, this list are very dynamic. So it is possible that, uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you see two accesses, it might be just a mistake because we didn't map the IP uh, correctly. So I think the, the only thing that you can, you can take from, from, from this slide is, is the United States and then Nigeria. Uh, next, uh, I will tell uh, one of the stories that uh, interesting, so interesting stories that we've seen within the account. So uh, we saw something that looked to us as a uh, spare phishing attack, not on a person, but on, on organization. This organization was uh, one of the world's largest telecommunication uh, operators. And uh, this, uh, the story began when we got uh, one of our accounts, Natalie. She got a, an email from Yahoo saying that there was suspicious activity from, uh, uh, from uh, her account and she should uh, look for it. So, of course, we started looking at it. So we didn't find anything interesting in the inbox. 
uh, we didn't find anything in interesting in the sent items. However, uh, since we already knew that the attacker sometimes forget uh, to look at the trash folder, we went to the trash. And there we found uh, uh, several very, very strong uh, evidence. We saw um, a failure, failure notification, a mail sending failure notification that came from, uh, uh, from a mail provider saying that uh, that mail uh, came back, that it wasn't uh, accepted, which is a strong evidence of, uh, of spam uh, being sent from, the, uh, from our account. Um, And we continue to, uh, uh, to analyze this, uh, uh, the content of, uh, uh, of uh, this account. And what we've seen there is, uh, oops, I'm sorry. And what we've seen there, we saw this, uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, message failure and notification. And uh, we found in the uh, many um, messages that were sent from our account, they were in the deleted, deleted in the trash folder, that were, uh, each one of them had uh, 10 uh, recipients. I, I'm sorry, each one of them had 50 recipients from, uh, one of the, of, from this organization that was uh, the target of, the, of this attack. Uh, well, where one of the recipients was common to all the messages and we saw 10 messages. So eventually it was uh, 500 recipients, uh, 490 that were uh, different uh, recipients and one of them that repeated 10 times, which we uh, assume that this is probably the account of the attacker himself because he's sending the messages and he wanted to, you know, to keep some level of control of management uh, for them. So uh, we took his uh, the, uh, mail address, this uh, Pedro something at uh, Yahoo, and we tried to uh, trace him. And actually, it was not very hard with social network and Facebook. We got to his Facebook account, and uh, we were not very surprised to see that he lives in Lagos, in Nigeria, and uh, uh, he was born there and a lot of uh, personal information about, uh, about him. So again, it was quite uh, disappointing to see that uh, attackers not always take the, even the minimal measures to, uh, uh, to, to keep safe. OK, so uh, that's about it. So I'll we'll summarize what we've seen. Uh, so I had a lot of numbers. Uh, only 44% of the uh, credentials that were leaked were eventually translated into actual uh, account uh, takeover. Uh, again, it was like fairly low. Even when there is account takeover, in only 46% it happened in the first uh, 24 hours after the, uh, the leakage. 23% uh, of attackers uh, looked for uh, data inside uh, the honey accounts that we've, uh, uh, that we've leaked. And only 60% of uh, the attackers uh, reused uh, the, uh, the credentials uh, trying to uh, propagate to other accounts of this, uh, of this user. 12% uh, of, uh, of the account hijacking uh, were uh, the, uh, the attackers abused our accounts to, uh, to launch uh, further attacks on uh, other accounts. And um, in 0% of the cases, we found the indication of any uh, automation of the, that the attackers uh, used. So what are the conclusions? Uh, first, I think, and, and foremost. So the phishing threat is a very, very old uh, threat. Uh, and there are a lot of research around it, but news, it is here to stay. It turns out to be very, very effective. Uh, the attackers have so many credentials, and the indication is that they're doing the analysis manually, so uh, the attackers even don't get to use all the uh, credentials that, they, that they're putting their hands on. Uh, maybe in the future when they'll start using automation or maybe even AI technology to investigate the data within the inbox, the phishing will become even more uh, effective than it is today. Uh, quick detection and mitigation of credential theft, for example, by changing the password, uh, can reduce the account hacking prob uh, probability by 54%, which is significant. Uh, it turns out that attackers are sometimes as sloppy as their victims or they don't care being identified, which is also can also be the case. And the password reuse is much less reused than, uh, by attackers than what is commonly uh, believed. Uh, and the, the fact that phishing is still uh, active uh, probably is because users are human and human is human. We have, the, we have our strength, we have uh, our uh, weaknesses. 
uh, users will continue to falling into social engineering uh, and to give the attackers the road in. Um, and they continue to be the weakest link and probably the, the most unpredictable link in the, in the organization. And we've seen the same also for the, for the red side, for the dark side, for the attackers. Uh, they fell into our uh, phishing scams uh, quite uh, easily. They left clear tracks of, in most of the accounts. And they were sloppy and left hints for, uh, gave us the opportunity even to, to, to get their uh, real identity. And I even add more than that, it's not only the, the blue and the red, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, cyber uh, experts or cyber vendors, uh, we just, uh, about a month ago, we had a hack the analyst case where uh, attacker, hackers took, uh, took over the account of a security analyst uh, from a large uh, vendor. I'm not, I'm, I, I redacted it because in the next time it can be, uh, it can be Imperva or, or, or me. Uh, and uh, just last week we saw another uh, large cyber vendor, antivirus company, that uh, had a supply chain attack where attackers uh, replaced, uh, added backdoor to, uh, to the download server of this, uh, of this company. So uh, nobody is immune, nobody is safe, everybody can be uh, sloppy. Uh, and the, uh, the users, the attackers, and even the cyber community. So I'll, uh, fi I'll finish with what I think are the takeaways for a security officer uh, from this uh, research. So first, Password reuse may provide the attacker's bridge to your network, which is something that, uh, that we knew. It, it is not as, uh, as strong as we expected, but, but, but it is there. And if the users use the same password for the Gmail and for their organization, and they give their Gmail uh, password away to, uh, uh, to phishing, then this can be used to, uh, to give the attacker the foothold in your organization. Uh, attackers are looking for data, which is, again, not uh, very surprising. Uh, and uh, phishing happens uh, uh, so often that you should assume that at any point of time, some of the users in the organization uh, are, uh, are uh, being hacked, or credentials are uh, in the wild. Uh, definitely if your uh, organization is more than uh, several dozen uh, employees. So when it comes to application security, uh, phishing detection is effective, meaning that if you have a, the detection mechanism that once uh, a, a user is uh, leaking his, his account credentials to, uh, to the wrong place, you can see that. And this sometimes can be done by looking at the referrer, or, uh, referrer header of a, a request coming to the application. Then it can be effective. And second, you should uh, take a, uh, deploy account takeover protection to, uh, to protect uh, the accounts of your users. When it comes to uh, enterprise network and data security, so you should assume that the perimeter is uh, breached. Uh, as I said, attackers will, are finding their way in, for example, and this is one of the vectors to, uh, to do that. And uh, it means that if you want to protect the data, you need to protect the, your, your critical data, uh, uh, also not at the perimeter, but close to the data uh, store as possible. Uh, uh, that's it. Questions? I have a few questions. Uh, did you contact Gmail, Facebook for additional data on what the attackers did inside, or did you find them in any of this? Uh, I'll uh, repeat the question. The question was whether we uh, uh, contacted uh, uh, Gmail or other uh, vendors uh, to get more further information about the accounts. No, we hadn't. But, uh, uh, this is a good uh, point. Maybe we should. Did you, uh, do you know what they did with the non-credential data they found inside this? email accounts such as credit card. Can you repeat the question? Do you know what the attackers did with the non-credential data they found inside the accounts, like credit card information or phone numbers? Uh, no. Well, w w when it was contact list, and at least in a couple of cases, we saw this contact list being used for, uh, to, to get a, a spam. When it was uh, you know, credit card numbers, then uh, we, we don't really know. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much for your attention.